Okay, just a few announcements and we'll begin the shiur. Um, for those who like to mark it down, the next shiur, the first Sunday of February, is February 4th, the 19th of Shvat. I assume the same place here. And we have an, an important announcement which I'll make now and I'll make later also, is a, a lecture tour is being organized for Rav Ginsburg to the United States that will take place after Shavuot, approximately from June 21st or 2nd, something like that, for two or three weeks. And so we are starting early, but it's not early enough that we're turning to people who are watching this, um, who are connected to various Beit Knesset or Kihilot, that um, if you're interested in Rav Ginsburg coming to your community, um, please be in touch with us through the, your, the WhatsApp or through the, the list for this shiur, um, that we're looking for places that will host the Rav. And it goes without saying that a trip like this and going from city to city um, takes a substantial financial, uh, a, a substantial financial reality to this. So we need more than just kind of like ideas of where the Rav can teach. <clears throat> We're looking for people who are interested in not only organizing it, but organizing the support that would be needed to bring Rav Ginsburg to your community. So. This announcement will be repeated many times over the next few months, but uh, the Rav has not done a lecture tour in America in a number of years, so this is a golden opportunity to bring Rav Ginsburg to your community. So good evening and good morning and afternoon to everyone around the world. As we just heard, today is the Yorset of the Rambam, who perhaps is the, the greatest well-known uh, scholar, both in the, in the realm of Halakha, Jewish law, he is the author of the Code. His most famous halakhic work is the Code of Law, 14 books that include all of the all of the 613 mitzvot of the Torah, commandments of the Torah, with their explanation, all of the details of the laws as handed down from Sinai in the Oral Torah. And as well, he is the author of the Guide to the Perplexed. His two great works, works are the Code and the Guide, which is philosophic work that expounds all of, uh, of Jewish thought in accordance with his uh, understanding, which we all probably know was based largely on uh, on Aristotle, that we'll discuss this a little bit this evening, today. Many great uh, authorities, even in his own time, when he was still alive and after he passed away, were not so uh, happy with his, uh, with his guide because of this very fact that we just now said that he based his uh, philosophic thought on, uh, on Aristotle. But nonetheless, he, uh, he has over the generations, we'll say, been proven by Jewish tradition to be, uh, to still remain the accepted authority in also, in a philosophic uh, thought. He does not always agree with Aristotle, as we'll also explain today. But 
What we're going to do this evening is uh, is go through different facets of his of his uh, thought and his uh, shita, his system, and in order to organize it in a pedagogic way, as we always do, we'll try to uh, to go through the different areas of thought in accordance with the shirot, with the ten shirot ending with the cat of the crown, which is the super-rational level of the soul, and concluding with Mahut kingdom. So let's immediately begin in this way. In the soul, the highest level of the soul is Emunah's faith. The primary uh, belief of the Rambam is that God has no corporal reality to himself whatsoever. And that to imagine corporality vis-a-vis -vis God is, is uh, borders on heresy. This does not just uh, go for uh, actual physical limbs like the finger of God, the hand of God, the voice of God. But it also applies to, uh, to attributes, to any spiritual attributes, even uh, good attributes, like God is kind. We're allowed to say that God is kind, but actually to think that God is kind in the same way that, that a man the human being is, is to be kind. It also borders on uh, anthropomorphism. When the Rambam speaks of faith, he differentiates between absolute or true faith, he calls it, versus necessary faith. What is the difference between true, true faith and necessary faith? The true faith is, as we just now said, that God has no attributes as we understand them whatsoever, just as he has no limbs or no corporality whatsoever. Necessary faith, he brings an example of that for all of us common folk, that we're all common folk, it's uh, important to believe that if I uh, misbehave, so God gets angry at me. The result of that anger can be in many different ways. But I have to, I have to feel in a certain sense and believe that, uh, that my actions affect God either to be happy with me or to be not happy with me. To get angry, and the, the example that he brings is actually is anger, the attribute of anger. This is most appropriate to, uh, to this month, that we're now in the month of Tevet, because according to Sevri Yitzhira, every month has a sense to it, and the sense of this month is actually called the sense of anger. So uh, the fact that the Ramba makes a point, a special point about talking about anger, is uh, most appropriate now to his yard site, which is the day that all of his life rises up and returns to its uh, source in order to bring down a blessing to all those that are connected to him. We all probably know that the, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, was very, very adamant about uh, studying the Rambam and feel connection to the Rambam. So this is the day to bring down blessing from his soul. And uh, once more, we're in a month whose, whose sense, spiritual sense, is, is referred to the sense of anger. So he talks about anger. He says that God doesn't get angry. And you can't say that God is. True faith is to know that, that anger and God do not go together. 
She was like, no attribute whatsoever can you link to God himself. But there is what he calls necessary faith to feel that if I do something wrong, so I, I, anger, I anger God. I make him angry with me. Of course, there's something which is a further extreme. Actually, there are three different categories of faith. There's true faith, and there's necessary faith, and there's false faith, which is false faith is to say that uh, that a person believes. If we still use this attribute of anger believes in an angry God. Some people think that uh, in different religions, even something people think wrongly about Judaism, about the Bible, that it pictures, it describes, depicts an angry God. So to think of God as an angry God, God forbid, to picture God as an angry God. And a person that believes in that is, is it's a super, a false belief is like saying superstition. It's a superstition altogether. It's called emunah, but it's also this, the term in Hebrew is emunah, emunah tefillah, false faith. So actually there are three different categories of faith. There's true faith. If now we use the example of anger. The true faith is that the anger, there's no anger. God is never angry. There's no such thing as anger in relation to God. The necessary faith is to feel that, that, that I anger God. And the false faith is to picture God as an angry old man or a young man. <laughs> That's superstition altogether, and that's false. So one most interesting thing that we see from this uh, simple analysis is that, uh, is that the Rambam actually places an intermediate zone between truth and falsehood. In classical logic, even in Arist Aristotle, a statement can e is either true or false. There's nothing in between. Actually, we had a series of, of, of talks, of classes about this a few weeks ago in Hebrew, about logic. And uh, classical logic, something is either true or false. There's nothing in between. If there's something in between true and false, that's already quantum logic. It's not classical logic. So we already have here some, uh, some hint, allusion, that the Rambam is way, way before his time, that the concept of necessary belief is not, it's neither true or false. It's something in between. Right, so this is, we, we chose this to be the first uh, point that we're, that we're making this evening is because it pertains to faith. Faith is the highest level of the soul. But actually it pertains to my faith in God, not to God's faith. How I believe in God. That a true mind, as according to the Ramas, will go on to explain the whole, uh, the whole purpose of man on earth is to perfect his intellectual conception of the divine. And to the extent that a person has succeeded in, in perfecting his contemplation of the divine of God, so once more, God and anger do not go together, just as God and any attribute do not go together. 
But for all of us, as we said before, that same, very same person at a simpler level of consciousness in daily life should feel that if I do something wrong, I anger God. On the other hand, to think of God as an angry figure, that's totally false. It's the opposite of the truth. Now we'll say something also at the level of Keter, of the crown, but from God's perspective on us, not from our perspective on him. And that will be regarding will, the power of will. For us, the highest power of the soul is faith. In general, the crown, the level of crown in Kabbalah is identified with will, the power of will, which is above the mind. The question is, how can God possess will in the first place? Because will is also a predicate. God wills, God wants something. How can God, according to the Rambam, according to the philosophy of the Rambam, says will? And especially, how can he will something anew? Because not only is it a question about willing something, it's also a question about change in what we'll call the Godhead. That no change can exist. We even have a verse, an explicit verse, that says, "On the Hashem no shaniti, I am God. I do not change." How can he will something new? That appears to be a change in God. This relates to the creation of the world, ex nihilo. At the very beginning of the Eitz Chaim, the classic text of Kabbalah of the Arizal. So we ask a very simp a simple sounding question. If the world is a good thing and God desires to create the world, why didn't he create it long ago? Way before he actually created it. Trillions of years before. <laughs> why did he wait so long? As the Arizal asked the question. So of course it seems like a very uh, obvious answer to the question because we're taught that, God, that time itself is a created reality. Before the creation of the world there was no time in the first place. So how can you ask a question, why didn't he create it before? But here the question is, the, it's actually the same question just in a different uh, garb that, that what, what around, if, if at a certain point, whether we'll call it time or not time, but at some level there's an arousal of will to create that appears to imply a change in God. As though before, whatever that word before and after means, before he did not will and now he does will. So something changed. So the Rambam deals with this also at length in, in the guide. And uh, the explanation is, in, in simple terms, that if there is, there is and was always an intention to will at a certain point, then when that point comes about and the will takes effect, that is not considered a change in God. Meaning that, in once more in the simplest words, also still using the, the, the thought, the concept of the context of time, if God had planned primordially, meaning from from ever and ever and ever ago, at a certain moment, to will, to actively will the creation of the world. So when that moment came and he willed, and thereby he created the world in that very split second, 
so that is no change in him. Since the intention was there from ever and ever ago. Meaning that actually he identifies here two levels of will. The actual will and the intention to will. Would there not be an intention to will, then the will would involve or imply a change. But if there was always an intention to will, then the will does not imply a change. That's the simple statement. Meaning that everything that God wills, as we say that we pray, a person is sick, and according to nature, he's, he's fatally, morally ill. But we pray, and God performs a miracle, and he answers the prayer, and the person gets well, and we obviously believe in this, and the Ram certainly believes in this. It's one of the principles of faith is that we should only pray to God, do not worship and do not pray anything else except God, the one God. So what happens? So he would not, before he did not have an explicit active will. In a moment we're going to talk about a concept which is called active intelligence versus potential or passive intelligence. But now we're talking the same idea or a similar idea at the level of will. Actively, there was not will to heal this individual. But through the means of prayer, the will came about. But according to the Rambam, in order that that, that does not imply a change in God, we must believe that there was an intention all the time from the beginning of time that when this particular person is sick and this particular person prays for him to, to recover, that God is going to create, as it were, a new will and miraculously heal this individual. And since that intention was there all the time, Ani Hashem no Shaniti. There is no change in God. Meaning that there is a hidden, concealed Ratzon in the terminology of Hasidut that is called Ratzon Atzmi, an essential will in God, which we can't fathom at all, just we can't fathom God at all. And that in itself has, so to speak, written within it all of the apparent changes of will that will be throughout the history of creation from beginning to end, based at least partially on the service of man in our prayers and our worship of God. Right, so now we learned about about the difference between primordial intention and act of will. Now let's turn to another concept, a related concept that we just now mentioned, that has to do with with wisdom. We know that the, some of the basic uh, critics of the Rambam, even in our, in our tradition, like the Maharami Prague, and afterwards the Hasidut, criticized the Rambam for apparently depicting God as pure, essential intellect. So in Tanya also, he 
explains that uh, God is one with his mind, but that God is not to be identified with intellect. And definitely when the, uh, when the uh, Arthur Rebbe learned the, uh, the guide of the Rambam, the Semerzedek, the third Rebbe of Chabad with his son, the fourth Rebbe learned, they learned the guide in accordance with a deep understanding of Hasidut. And one of the most important things is that God is not to be defined as perfect intellect, as perfect mind, something else, something which totally transcends mind. Nonetheless, the concept of mind and intellect is very, very important and central to the thought and the system of the Rambam, Maimonides. And one of the important concepts, and here also he differs with Aristotle, is the concept that we mentioned before, which is called Seichel HaPoel, active intelligence. According to Aristotle, active intelligence and God, if there is a God or a creator, are identified as the same. But according to the Rambam, they're definitely not the same. As God is not to be defined as the Seichel HaPoel, the active intelligence, but the first thing which exists, or we'll call it also the intermediate, which connects the soul of man and the intellect of man to God, is this concept which is called the active intelligence. Now, active intelligence versus passive intelligence. What does passive intelligence mean? It means the ability to, to know. I say that a child is born with a high IQ. So that high IQ that he possesses from the moment that he's born, that's his passive intelligence. But when he learns and he studies and he knows, that's the passive intelligence that become active, that become, has been actualized, has become actual intelligence. Now intelligence in God is always actual. It's called Seichel HaPoel. It's a very beautiful, the first day again, Matthew will make this evening. That, that term, Seichel HaPoel, which the Rambam uses and, and uh, loves, will calculate the, the uh, value of that phrase, Seichel HaPoel. So we'll see that it equals 541, which is the same value as Israel as Israel. There's something about this, this most important concept in the teaching of the Rambam, which now we're placing at the level of wisdom, which is Seichel HaPoel, and that is the origin of the soul, according to this, as alluded to by this Gematria that we just now mentioned, this is the origin of the soul of Israel even though it's most important to know that on the on the simple level in the guide this is one of the differences between the guide and the and the code the Rambam has its two pillars of both of the expertise that is the greatest expert in both fields and two pillars of uh, of we'll even call it personality as we'll go on to explain to the extent that later philosophers and later sages, both religious and secular, sometimes get the feeling that we have two Rambams. They appear to be so different from one another. The Rambam of the Code and the Rambam of the Guide so this may be the most important thing that we'll have to try to, uh, to understand a little bit today. But, but we're now explaining that uh, that in the guide and in most of the teachings of the Rambam, the philosophic teachings, he makes it very clear that every single human being, whether Jew or non-Jew, in accordance with his deeds 
and his devotion to knowing God, the one and only God, so can he merit even to prophecy. Now, actually, the Ram is not the first one to say this. There's an explicit saying in Tana Devedia on one of the Midrashim of Chazal. It all depends upon deed and sincerity of heart in searching for God. And there's no distinction which is made between Jew and non-Jew in this respect. So once more, that's the feeling that you get in learning the guide, that it's, uh, that um, the word secular is a problematic word, obviously. But if we just understand secular to mean that there's no difference between Jew and non-Jew, so it's definitely has that, uh, that tone to it. And that's why the Rambam allows himself to rely so much in his philosophy on a non-Jew. On a non-Jew that, uh, that represents and symbolizes Greek culture. Exactly what we're just now coming out of the holiday of Hanukkah in this very month of Tevet, which is the month of the Orset of the Rambam. The holiday that uh, commemorates our victory over Hellenistic culture. And the Ram himself allows himself, and obviously he's uh, properly relying upon the verse, Yav Tedokim Liyafet Vishkon Baal Eishem, that, that uh, God has given beauty in different forms to Yafet, who is the, one of the sons of Noah from whom Greece derives. And it would dwell in the tents of Shem. And the tents of Shem means in Jewish culture. It will become incorporated within Jewish culture. So obviously that's what the Ram is doing. But then we have to understand even deeper what is, what is the battle, the ongoing, in our day also, the ongoing battle between Hellenism and Judaism. So this question maybe we'll not right now answer. Just the question is a question, and the Rambam is here to relying and praising. He praises Aristotle to the, the highest possible praise. At the same time, he disagrees on many, many, many different uh, matters. So once more, now we, we'll, go, we'll go back to our Seichel HaPoel, the active intelligence. If God wants to convey prophecy to a human being who has made his ultimate effort to, to know God and to purify himself, then the prophecy flows from God through the act of intelligence, the Seichel HaPoel, to the intelligence of that individual. So actually, according to the Ram, in the simplest, uh, the simplest diagram, there are actually four levels. There's God, which some feel that the Ram himself says that God is the ultimate intelligence, more than the act of intelligence ultimate, absolute intelligence. From that, and we said before that we do not want to identify God as intelligence. Nonetheless, some feel that the Ramam does understand or believe in God as the absolute intelligence, but just like any predicate, we cannot use intelligence as I know intelligence, understand intelligence to be as a predicate to God or as a dis descriptive of God. But God is wise. What that means, we'll go on, on try to understand a little bit more. Then comes the Seich Lapoel, which is the intermediate between God and, and the intelligence of man. Then comes the spiritual, non-corporal intelligence of the soul, which is even above what is called the nefesh. According to the Rambam, Seichel 
pure intelligence of man is above what's called the nefesh, the soul of man. And then comes the seichel of man as it is embodied in a body. And since it's in a body, my mind is in my body, so my body has involves imagery of corporal things, corporal reality. That is called kuach hamedameh, the power of imagination. But the prophet, the true prophet, also employs his power of imagination, purifies to a certain extent his power of imagination, and that is all the symbolism of prophecy. So actually, how does prophecy work? according to the Ramp. It works from God to the Seicha HaPoel, to the pure, non-corporal intelligence of the soul, to the corporal Koach Hamdameh, power of imagination in the soul as the soul is embodied in a body. So actually these four levels themselves can be seen to be identified or correspond to the four letters of Hashem's name, Yud Kei The power of beginning from below, the power of imagination or the intelligence within a body and images, corporal images, reflecting spiritual uh, insight. That is the lowest level. That's the level of Malchut, the final Hay of Hashem's name. The Seichel of man itself, the non-corporal intelligence of man, that can be seen as the, as the Vav, that these two levels are intelligence of man. The Vav and the Hay of Hashem's name are called Vihaniglot Lano Levaneno, the two levels that pertain to us. But then above that is an intermediate level between God and us, which is called the the Seichel Apoel, which according to the Gematria that we mentioned before, can be seen, can be understood, at least by us, can be understood to be the root of the, of Knesset Israel, the, the collective soul of Israel. And above that is God himself. That's the flow chart of prophecy. But this, this whole concept of Seichel HaPoel will place that at the level of Chochmah in the, in the overall picture of the philosophy of the realm of Maimonides. Now we'll move on to the next level, which is the level of Bina, of understanding. And we'll base this uh, Every level here is a, is a little meditation in and of itself. This meditation is, is according to the very common, popular adage that Mi Moshe Ad Moshe Lo Kam Ki Moshe. This adage actually is more or less from the time of the Rambam himself. He was so loved and appreciated and revered in his own generation, and the generations that immediately followed him, that the people said, and this became, it became a, a ma'amar, ma'amar ha'am of the people that said, from Moses to Moses, none arise as Moses. There was no one like Moses. I mean, from Moshe Rabbeinu, the giver of the Torah to Am Yisrael, that again, most appropriately, this is exactly what we're reading about in the Torah, about Moshe Rabbeinu being born and coming to redeem us and then give us the Torah and then build the tabernacle, just at this time of the Yorzeit of the Ramba. That from Moses to Moses, no one stood up as Moses. We know that when Hashem first spoke to Moses, to Moshe Rabbeinu, which we read this just yesterday in Shabbos. So he calls him by name twice. He repeats his name twice, Moshe, Moshe. And Moshe answers, Hineni, here, here, here I am, ready. 
do here and accept. Even though afterwards he actually argued for a whole week, for seven days, not to accept the, uh, the mission that God intended for him. But he answered immediately with perfect humility, as we know that he was Anav Mahdi, was the most humble of all men, he nanny, just like Abraham, when he was addressed, also answered it, and the other great Hasidim answered, he nanny, this word, he nanny, here I am, I'm ready. But God spoke to him and said, Moshe, Moshe, we already said, uh, mentioned this word, Hineni. We also uh, see a very beautiful Geomatia, uh, that Hineni equals 115. Moshe is 345. What's the, what is the, three times, meaning that the average value of the three letters of Moshe equals Hineni. So God calls him Moshe, Moshe, and he answers Hineni. So the, again, so that there are other great great figures in the Tanakh that answer God, Hineni, here I am, the first of which is Abraham. Well, now I'll mention that according to the Ram, the two greatest figures in the Bible that we are to emulate are Abraham and Moses of the two figures that he loves the best. So the first to answer Hineni is Abraham, but nonetheless this word Hineni is the average value of the three letters of Moses. Another word that equals the exact value of 115, like Hineni, is Chazak. For which reason, after we complete a Humash, like last week when we completed the first Humash, the first of the five books of Moses, which that's we call them, the five books of Moses, so we all proclaim together Chazak, Chazak, Benit Chazak, or according to some version, just three times repeat Chazak, 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 which equals Hineni, 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 which equals Moshe. It's as though Moshe himself, in our coming out of our mouths, is signing his signature on that book of the Pentateuch, of the five books of Moses. So once more, God calls Moses by repeating his name twice. There are other figures whose name is also repeated twice, Abraham, Jacob, and Samuel, Shmuel. That God calls them twice, repeats the name, Abraham, Abraham, Yaakov, Yaakov, Shmuel, Shmuel. In each of those three cases in the Bible, there is a line called a psikta, a vertical line, which separates, it's not in the Torah scroll, but in a, in a Bible with cantillation marks. So there is a cantillation mark that differentiates between the two names. I mean, there's a difference between the first appearance of the name and the second appearance of the name. But only in the case of Moses, there is no difference, there's no line which, which separates the two names. So many, many explanations of what this means. But in our context, based upon this popular adage of me Moshe, 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 that from Moses, Moses, no one stood up like Moses, so we can say that that goes to say that from Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, the first Moshe, until the, our second Moshe, which is the Rambam, there's absolutely no differentiation between them whatsoever, no separation. They're virtually the same. If this is the way that we understand, so probably in the, in the case of the other figures, like Abraham, Abraham, so there must be, just like Abraham Avino, there's probably another Abraham, Another very great Abraham, maybe it's the Ibn Ezra, maybe it's some other great Abraham, but there's a line between the two. The same Yaakov, the same as Samuel, Shmuel, but Moshe, Moshe, Mi Moshe Ad Moshe, from Moses to Moses, there's no, there's no uh, separation. Nonetheless, we can't, uh, this, the, one of the cr criticisms of the Rambam is that uh, 
that you uh, you like Aristotle. What about Moses? Moses Mo, Moshe Rabbeinu, the first one, was he also into Aristotle? <laughs> so uh, that sounds absurd to uh, to say such a thing. But uh, what would the Rambam answer to that? The Rambam's answer is obvious, and he actually says it. He says that Aristotle didn't invent it. The, the Israel, Aristotle took it from the prophets. He took it from the from the patriarchs. This is the simple thing that he's. I'm not relying upon Greek culture per se. They just took it. This is truth. We know that one of the most famous, greatest things that the Ram said is that receive the truth from he who says it. And the truth here, no one has has. Uh, possession and monopoly on the truth. And the truth is that Abraham was the first to know what Aristotle afterwards wrote. And certainly Moses knew. He knew it in his way, in his language, in his, uh, in his signon, in his style. No two prophets prophesy with the same style. Everyone has his style. But it's the same thing. So it's even deeper as we're going to see. He definitely, the Ram says that Moses is much deeper than Aristotle. Even though I have studied and I respect very, very much uh, Aristotle as a human being. Nonetheless, after all of this is said, to say that Moses, Moses himself, Moshe Rabbeinu, the first Moses, and the second Moses are exactly the same thing, even though there's no line between them, according to Kabbalah, we have to have some way to, still to differentiate in some manner. What is, what is the best possible way to, to express that? One of the phrases in Chazal about Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, the first Moses, is that Moshe Zachad Bina. Moses merited to understanding. Now we're talking about the level of understanding. If we study, this is from the sages, that Moses merited understanding. When we begin to study Kabbalah, so the Arizal teaches us and he teaches from the from the Tanakh, from the Bible, that in the Bible we find two words for understanding. It's either Bina, is the normal word, as mo, as it says in this phrase, Moshe Zachad Bina, or a related word from the same root, which is Tivuna. And the Rizal explains that Bina is a higher level of understanding, and Tivuna is a lower level of understanding. That Bina is, is pure, perfect understanding, and Puna is, um, is understanding that pertains to the attributes of the heart. So if we want to differentiate within Bina, or we say between these two great figures, that both of them understood under the godliness. One is Moshe Rabbeinu, and the other is the Rambam. Mi Moshe, Ad Moshe, Lo Kank Moshe. And both of them merited the understanding. But let's say it in this way, that Moses, the first Moses, merited to Bina Ila'a, to Ima Ila, to the higher, understanding is called the mother figure, to the higher mother figure. And the Rambam will credit him with meriting to the lower, to the relatively lower mother figure, which is called Tfuna, which is the power to integrate understanding into the heart. Why, why do we think that this is a, uh, is a proper way to, uh, to distinguish between the two Moseses, Moshe, Moshe. There's another popular phrase which from the very generation of the Rambam 
was used to praise and describe the Rambam. He was called for some reason Hanesher Hagado. But today is the orthodox of the Rambam. And when you speak of the Rambam, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon he is very often called Hanesher Hagado, the great eagle. So I hope that he's happy with that, being called the great <laughs> eagle. He didn't like symbolism. <laughs> for God, this one thing, maybe for himself, okay. But the, he is called the great eagle. So if he's the great eagle, and he's the same as Moses, so who's Moses? We never, I never heard that Moses is called the great eagle, or the great something else. I, I'm not, but maybe Moses is, but does, Mo, does Moses have to do with any uh, animal figure that we know? It's, the Rambam is referred to as the great eagle. So who can remember what, what is Moses referred to? Why was he given this name at the beginning when he was born? His father and mother didn't even give him a name as recorded in Torah. And the one that gave him his name was, was the daughter of the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, Batya, her name is. And she called him Moses, why? Because Moses means that I've drawn him out of the water. So if I've drawn him out of the water, first of all, who's his father? This is also a very clear correspondence to the second Moses, which is the Rambam. What's the name of his father? Maimon, Maimon is from the water. I want to say other things about my mom. But Moses, the first Moses, is called Moses because he's drawn out of the water, mina meshitio. And what is, if he's drawn out of the water, what, what does he symbolize? What type of a soul is he? It says there, is, there are diff, two different types of souls we're taught in Kabbalah. There's a soul which is a land animal soul. And there is a soul which is a, it was an ocean soul. There's a soul which is a fish. And there's a soul which is a land animal. And this explicitly says in the, both in the Midrash and in the Zohar, that Moses is the example, the greatest example, par excellence of a fish soul. How do I know that Moses is a fish? First of all, what's his mazal? His mazal is Adar, which is mazal dagim. That's his, that's his mazal. He was born and, and uh, passed away on the same day, Zion Adar, which is mazal dagim. And his Zion, he was the seventh of Adar. Zion equals fish, dag. Dag equals seven. So he's the dog of Mazal Dagim. But there's something even more important about him that it makes him a, uh, makes him a fish. It says that who's the father of Yoshua? His, his, uh, he, Moshe Rabbein was the mentor of his greatest disciple was Joshua, who took us, the Jewish people, into the land of Israel. And Joshua, is, his full name is Yoshua bin Nun, the father, the son of Nun, and Nun, his father, it says in, in the Midrash and the Zohar, as well, that it refers as well to his spiritual father, who's his spiritual mentor, whose name is also Nun, and Nun means fish, in Aramaic. So, Moses is called, not just dark, he's called Nun. Nun also has to do with what we said before, that Moshe Zachar the Bina. How many gates of understanding are there? Fifty. And the fiftieth is the, the one which is incomprehensible. But that fiftieth gate of understanding, which is called Shar Hanun, is the level that he received both twice, at the giving of the Torah, 
And at the moment that he departed from this realm, from this order. So the nun also refers to the Shar Hanun, to the 50th gate of understanding, which Moses attained. Nun 50 also equals the phrase in the book of Jonah, which also has to do with a, he was swallowed up by a fish, by a giant fish. How is it called? It's called Dag Gadol. Dag Gadol equals 50. Dag is seven. But Dag Gadol, a big fish, is 50. That's, that's Moses. So actually, the relation between Moses and the Rambam is, they're both implied in the word nun. Because nun is written nun, Vav Nun, which can be Nun Vinesher, because Nesher also begins with a Nun. So it's a giant fish and a great eagle. That's the Mi Moshe Ad Moshe Lo Kanke Moshe. If we want to make a little bit a deeper uh, analysis of these two words, Nun and Nesher, so each has three letters to it. And if we, if we perform a, uh, a simple uh, mathematical function, which is called haka'a pratit, like in English it's a taking a dot product, meaning that we multiply nun times nun, 50 times 50 is 2,500, then vav times shin, the vav of nun times the shin of nesher, we get 1,800. Then the nun, the final nun of nun, times the resh of nesher, we get 10,000. Altogether, how much did we get? No. 2,500, 1,800, and 10,000. What? There, there we have it. 1,430. 1,430 is a very significant number. It's a multiple of Hashem's name of 26. Let's divide it by 26 and see what we get. We get 550 times 26, but 550 is Nesha. So by this process, there's no, re no reason on earth and also from ocean, from sea. There's no reason under sea and no reason on earth over earth that the result of this uh, function gives us a multiple of one of the two words, which is Nesher Havai, the eagle of God, both together, meaning that the Moses, the first Moses, enters into the second Moses, and it all together becomes God's eagle. All right, so all of this, we're placing now this understanding that the two are two different levels of understanding. That the first Moses is the higher level of understanding and the second Moses is the lower level of understanding. And about that is said that me Moshe ad Moshe lo kanke Moshe. And Moses in general merits to understanding. Right now we'll go on to the next level, which is the level of knowledge. This is perhaps the most important thing about the philosophy of the Rambam. His philosophy, his theology, is referred to as negative theology. Negative theology means that I can only know God through negation. There's no positive way of knowing God, as we said before in relation to anger, that the true faith is, is that anger and God cannot go together because nothing can go together with God. No attribute whatsoever can be given to God. So if, I, if it says in the Torah that God is wise, what does that mean, according to the Rambam? 
It means that God is not not wise. It is not correct to attribute to God anything other than wisdom, anything which is the opposite of wisdom. But, once more, now we have something very, very important, as we said before at Ketra, that there's some quantum logic in the thought of the Ramp. Because according to, to, to simple logic of Aristotle himself, to be not not wise is two minuses in simple logic, two minuses equal a plus. So if the meaning of negation is not not, the opposite is when I say that God is wise, I mean that God is not not wise, but not not wise is, is, is the same thing as saying that God is wise. So what do I accomplish? I accomplish nothing. But that's not what the Rambam has in mind. What does the Rambam mean when he says that God is not that wise? It means that God is not that wise, and at the same time, God's wisdom is, in, in, is not comparable, comparable to any possible image or understanding of wisdom that I, a human being, can possess. In saying so, the Ram was actually just phrasing, rephrasing a saying from Patach Eliyahu, the introduction to Tikkun Zohar, which probably he did not see, even though some people think that maybe he did see some of the texts from the Zohar. But this is a classic example that in the famous Patach Eliyahu, introduction to the beginning of the Tikkun Zohar, that we read every week before Shabbos, it says there that unto hakim velo you are wise, but not with any understandable, comprehensible wisdom. So you are wise, but in no possible way that I understand what your wisdom means, what that means for you to be wise. So when the Ramam says that I cannot say that God is wise, as I understand wise to be, and I can only express it through negation, he means that the negation of not not is not the same that minus minus equals plus. But it's minus minus and something else, something in addition to minus minus, which is antu hakim velo bechokma yidiyah. This is called Yidi'at HaShlila. Knowing, trying to come closer, as we'll explain a little bit more, to come closer to God through knowing God through negation. And this, the, the, this is the service of man, the most essential service of man on earth, is to come close to God through negation of all physicality, of all corporality. And once more, to be able to negate, whereas if, if it would be the opposite, for instance, God is angry, we said before, God is an angry, that I can say no, God is not an angry God. I don't need a double negation. But to say that God is a kind, a loving, a loving kind God, I need a double negation. I can only, that if I want to say that in truth, I have to say that God is not not kind. But his kindness means I, I'm allowed to say God is kind. But when I say God is kind, I have to understand that I mean that God is not not kind, and that, and that what I am saying that God is kind is a kindness that I cannot comprehend. I'm just allowed to say that, that God is kind, because that's the way it feels to me. That's the way the energy reaches me. But to say that God is cruel, that I can say that God is not cruel, period. I don't need negation, an additional negation for that. Okay, so... This is called the Atashtida. According 
to Hasidut, there is also a possibility of the soul, as we said before, the ground is not distinguished between a Jewish soul and a non-Jewish soul. But in according we, we begin learning the Tanya, and the second chapter begins with the fact that a Jewish soul is something special, that it's a chedek elokam imamamash. And because of that, there is a direct way for that spark of godliness in the Jewish soul to know, which means to contact, to identify God. <clears throat> you know, to a little bit appreciate and understand this, there's a, a famous word, uh, a famous saying of Rabbi Hillel of Parat, one of the great Hasidim, that he says that all of one's life, one is searching after a lost melody that one heard at some primordial point in his, uh, in his soul's reincarnations of the origin of the soul and godliness. And he comes down to earth and he searches for this melody. And every melody that he hears, he go, when he hears a new melody, he runs, he runs to listen to the melody. But after hearing the melody, he says, that's not, that's not it. And so he lives through his whole life, trying to remember that melody and hearing myriads of melodies, and each one saying at the end, no, that's not the, that's not the melody. So this is very similar to, uh, we can never know anything about God. But if we nonetheless use this, uh, this story, there is something, the soul did once hear this melody. And at some point, the soul will once more hear this melody. That's called Yediat HaChiyuv, positive theology. So actually, one important way of understanding, of making a, 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 a symbol or an acronym for Yudke Vavke is that Hashem's name of four letters, just the two letters, two letters by themselves are the intellectual letters, and they form a divine name by itself, the second two letters by themselves. The second two letters do not form a divine name. But the ultimate is to put it all together and for us, the phrase will be Yidiat Ashrila vi Yidiat Achiyuv. There are many other examples that Yud Kevavki is, is a phrase which begins Yud and He, and then the second two letters read V and another phrase which begins the same way. A complementary phrase. So for our for our uh, contemplation right now, we'll say that Yud Kevavke is the Rambam's way of knowing God, which is Yidiat Ashtila, knowing God through negation. And the Hasidic way, the possibility of, of hearing this melody once more, because I, some place in my soul, it's there. The impression of divinity, of positive divinity of knowing God is there. I just have to, to hear it, to merit to hear it once more. Yud ke vav ke yediat ha-shila v'yediat ha-chiyuv. About Moses it says, one of the most important phrases about Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, is lo chen avdi Moshe. No, yes, not so. Not so is my servant Moses, and all of my house he is faithful. This is what God says about Moses in the Torah. Lo chen avdi Moshe. So those two words, not so, is comparing him to other prophets. That other prophets prophesy in dream, in what's called a translucent pain, but Moses sees God through, as it were, a translucent pain, a transparent pain. 
אז זה שהוא רוצה, זה לא כן עבדים או שנאצו, ו-those two words נאצו are literally no, yes. So from this we learn a very, very deep teaching that Moses knows God. First, no, no is negative theology, the Rambam's approach. But yes, there's also a positive theology, and that's a yud ke vav ke altogether. The word lo is 30 and 1. 30 of the three higher sphero, the yud ke. The 1 is the level of knowledge which unifies the yud ke. Then comes ken, the word ken is 70. Written Cain, Kav, Nun, 20 and 50. 70 of the seven attributes of the heart of the Vav Kev Hashem's name. Lo, the higher level, and Ken, the lower level, but they have to unite together. Lo, Chen, Abdi, Moshe, Bechor, Beitin, Nehema. Now we'll go on to Chesed. Chesed, the Ram says that God is perfectly good, but as we said before, to be perfectly good means that he is not not good, and his goodness is absolute. The way that he's good, I can say that he's good, and I should say that he's good. He's only good, but it's not, but truly, in regard to him, he's not good in any way that I can understand what good means. Just like it says unto Chakim v'lo b'chok it's actually the the Balatanya says that that also goes for all of the Sfirot, not for, just for wisdom and understanding, as it says in Patach Eliyahu. But that goes for all of the Sfirot, Rantu Chasid Velo Bechesed Yediya, Rantu Gibor Velo Begibura Yediya, and so forth and so on. All of the attributes of God are the same thing vis-a-vis -vis God. Where does evil come from? One of the most important philosophical queries. So the Ramam says that 99% of evil a person does to himself. If something bad happens to someone, so the majority of the chance is that he is responsible himself for that bad happening to him. There is a small minority of chance, says the Tarambam, that the bad is what other people do to him. And there's even a smaller minority of chance that the bad is from nature. That's more. It's a, a, simple, a simple but most important teaching of the Rambam. What's important is the proportions that he gives. Because many people would say that most bad that happens in the world is just nature is making, is, is responsible, is to blame for the evil in the world. Other will say that who's responsible for the evil? The government, or my, or, or my friends, my so-called friends. They're the ones that did it. But then there is who's responsible for the evil? I'm responsible. If it's evil to me, I'm responsible for. So this is, one, this is one of the most important, simple teachings of the Rambam. That the minority is nature, and there's another larger, but also a very small minority, which is other people. And the, the overwhelming majority of evil is what a person does to himself. It means that there are three categories of evil. Those three categories of evil are where evil comes from. According to the Ram, correspond to the three lower worlds in Kabbalah. Bri'ah, Yitzhira, Asiya, Afasitiv. The majority of evils explained in the Kabbalah is in this world of Asiya, and that evil is what a person does to himself. 
Less than that is the evil that other people do to him, and that that's from the world of Yitzhira. And less than that is what just nature, God created nature. But nature also, nature has laws to it, and sometimes bad, what appears to be bad things come out of nature. Some uh, catastrophe of nature. Very small proportion, but it happens. That's the world of creation, the world of Bria. But the, when it comes to good, there are four levels of good. What are the four levels of good? There are only three levels of bad, but there are four levels of good. Because all of these three levels can also be good. If I breathe, nature is doing me a favor. So there's infinitely more good that comes from nature than bad that comes from nature. There's also much more good that comes from other people. I have to recognize, I have to be grateful and thank other people for all the good that they bestow upon me. Much more than the evil. Even vis-a-vis -vis myself, this is already questionable because there's so much bad that I do to myself. But I also sometimes am good to myself. So all the three, just like there are three sources of evil, that you have the same three sources of good. But there's another source of good, which there's no corresponding level to evil at all. And that's what God does directly, because no evil comes from God at all. What's more, evil, as it says, the verse says, no evil descends from heaven at all. But good definitely does. Sometimes it's enclosed within nature, and sometimes it's, it's, a, it's not enclosed within nature, but if it's not enclosed within nature, it's a miracle. But miracles also sometimes are enclosed in natural garb, and sometimes are, are revealed, like we're now beginning to read about the, the Ten Plagues and all the other miracles of the Exodus of Egypt. That's coming from the world of Atsilut. So once more, evil can come from one of the three lower worlds. It's called nature, other people, and myself. And good can come from all of the four worlds, from the world of Atsidu, which is good coming directly from God, or enclosed within nature, or through the means of other people, or afasitiv sometimes from myself. In short, because now we're, <laughs> we're being told to, to make it brief, short and sweet. So I'll try to make it as short and sweet as possible. We will not relinquish <laughs> all the other three wrote. So we have here, we've reached uh, Ches, and now we have to go to Gura. Gura, we'll just say very short, is the Yada Chazaka. The law of the Ram, the code, is called the, the strong hand. It's divided into 14 books. Of all numbers, the Ram liked the number four the best, and second best, he liked the number 14. Why? Because he was born on the 14th of Nisan. The very first book that he wrote is called The Treatise on Logic, Miloti Gayun, which he divides on purpose into 14 chapters. Then his great code of Jewish law is the 14 books of the Yad HaChazakah, the Mishneh Torah. So we see already, this is called Chazakah in Hebrew, when something repeats itself three times, it's called a Chazakah. So in the Rambam, there's a very simple Chazakah 14 that he likes which is his birth date and his first book that he wrote and his most important book of Jewish Hadacha, which is the code all based upon the number 14. And the 14 is, is called Yad There the three hands in Kabbalah, the great hand, which is the right hand, and the strong hand, which is the left hand, and the uplifted hand, which is actually the body itself, which is like a hand that rises up through the means of the through the channel of the head. The strong hand, which is the hand of the Rambam, it all has to do with Exodus. All these hands appear in the context of the Exodus that we're reading about now in the Torah. 
And the strong hand is the left hand, which is the, la the hand of law, and that's uh, most appropriate to the, to the code, to his code. So that concept of the strong hand of the Rambam, and also according to the Arizal, the soul of the Rambam itself comes from the left, from Gvura. So we'll place that in Gvura. The next Svira is, is uh, Tiferet. Tiferet is beauty. One of the meanings of Tiferet, of beauty, is feeling close to God. As we said before, some of the critics of the Rambam criticize the fact that according to the Rambam, the only, the one and only way to truly be close to God is through knowing God intellectually through devoting, dedicating one's life to meditation, to contemplation. That way you come close, that means close to God. Several hundred years after, the, about 200 years after the Rambam came, came a very great sage called Reb Christai Krakas, and wrote a book called Or Hashem, which actually was a critique on the Rambam. And one of his most important points that we discussed at length about a year ago or so is that, is that to be a good Jew and to be close to God is not a function, a sole function of, of mind. It's more a function of heart, of sincerity, of heart, of love, of being a good person. That's the way, that's mean, that brings you close to God. And so obviously Hasidus would probably follow that, that latter opinion. But according to the Rambam, to be close to God is a function of one's, <coughs> one's intellectual knowledge of God. And to that purpose, one should devote his life. Knowledge is the inner soul of Tiferet, according to Kabbalah. And much more, Tiferet is the feeling of being close to God. How does, what more does that mean? If I'm close to God, it means that God is close to me. So the Ram says that the person who's closer to God, there is more providence on that person. Providence is the eyes of God seeing and guarding you and taking care of you. Taking care of you. The eyes of God in Kabbalah refer to the two the pra practical eyes of God looking over a person, taking care, correspond to the next two spherot, which is called Netzach and Hod. That providence is of pure, in pure proportion to one's closeness. So if, according to the Rambam, the, one's closeness to God is a function of Da'at, which is the inner soul of Tiferet, from that then comes out the, the providence over the person. And once more, the Rambam does not distinguish between Jew and non-Jew. Hasidus, in order to, under the Rambam, rationalized the Torah to fit with his understanding. Hasidus, in learning the Rambam, also tries to rationalize the Rambam in order to place him into the context of Hasidus. How does it do so in respect to this particular point that we just now made? Hasidus explains that when the Rambam speaks of more providence over one who knows God more and less providence over one who knows God less, that only means revealed providence. How much it's revealed, but in truth, according to the simple faith of understanding of the Baal Shem Tov, there is particular providence over every minute, the smallest phenomenon of reality. It's just a question of how much it is revealed, how much it's concealed. And this is the way that Hasidus rationalizes, 
If we don't learn the Rambam, we don't need this rationalization at all. But if we want to learn the Rambam and make it fit into the into, into the understanding of Hasidus, this is the way to, that we rationalize the Rambam, that he's speaking of only of revealed providence. The next is Yesod. One of the meanings of Yesod in Kabbalah and Hasidut is order. We've spoken about this many times. Once more, one of the great criticisms against the Rambam is that even though he writes that the 13th principle of faith is to believe in the resurrection, many great sages in his time and immediately afterwards, and this is in the generations afterwards, said that deep down, I think that you do not believe in resurrection. And for which reason he had to write a whole treatise called Igeret Triyat Amitim, in order to justify himself that he does believe in, in resurrection. But that was, that's one of his 13 principles. Why, how, how, how did this problem arise in understanding the Rambam? How could the people think that he doesn't believe in resurrection? So the reason is very simple, because he says that the world to come is purely soul without body. Since he makes it very strong, and even it's so strong that, that if you believe otherwise, you, you're a fool. Because a body cannot exist forever, and the world to come is forever. A body is finite, and a, a finite, and a finite corporal body must die, must perish. Entropy, and the Rambam believes in the law of entropy. A body cannot exist forever. So the world to come is purely spiritual, according to the Rambam. So once more, that angered many, many Jewish great sages to the extent that this is one of the reasons that it is after the Rambam, there are many uh, cases of attempts at least to, to excommunicate all of, the, uh, all of the writings at least of the, uh, the philosophical writings of the Rambam. They were even burned, but there were other great, other great Hasidic texts that were burned, other things that were burned in history. So it's a big, apparently it's a big honor to be, to have your, to have your books burned. In any event, the Rambam also had, had that honor at a certain point. And uh, how does the Rambam explain? The Rambam, his belief, and this is what he explains in the Igarata and Tichayat Amitim, so that definitely there will be a physical resurrection of the dead, but it will only be a temporal phenomena, temporal reality. And since the bodies will return and bodies cannot live forever, they will live for a hundred years or for however long, doesn't matter, and they will die. And what will remain will be an eternal spiritual world to come. That is the faith of the Rambam. And once more, this was not accepted by many of his peers. But that's what he believes. It means he believes in resurrection, but he does not believe that that state of resurrection is forever. That what is forever is a purely spiritual reality of the soul, which is non-corporal, because he does not believe in corporality. Okay, even this Hasidus tries to rationalize in a certain way, which we will now not go into. Rationalize means to put it into the system that we believe that the physical world will remain forever. How do we, how can we believe that? Because the film is just the same, very, very short, that there will be some transformation of physicality. The corporality itself will undergo a metamorphosis. The physical reality will, will rise to a state that is no longer under the law of entropy. It's just to be said in short. But according to the Ram once more, the Ram makes it very clear 
that there are two stages. One is the resurrection, the other is the world to come. Two different things, say dinim, different things altogether. Before that is a third different thing, which is called Yomoto Mashiach, the Messianic era, which is just like, just like our time, according to the Rambam. Before that is called Olam Azeh, and before that is called Tohu. So again, I'm now saying very interesting. But Yisod is putting historical stages into order. So in Yisod, we're now explaining that according to the Rambam, if you want to put the whole history of creation into order, there are actually five stages. Two given stages and three stages to come. According to the Arizal, every human soul is created with two spiritual levels called the Nefesh and the Ruach. But then there are three yet to come, which are called the Neshama and the Chaya and the Echida. The same is according to the spiritual history and order of reality. The two given stages are called what preceded our physical order, which is Tohu. And then our present physical order, which is Olam Hazen. And then the days of Mashiach, the purpose of which, according to the Rambam, as he explained at the end of the code, is simply knowledge, the ability to have everything at the tip of your fingers to be able to know God, which is the Neshama, Nishma Shakai Tevinim to know and understand, to contemplate God. That's the Yimot HaMashiach. Then comes the Chaya. What is the Chaya, the level of Chaya? As the word says, Chaya is Tchia, is resurrection. Tchia Tamitim. But then the fifth level, the Echida, that's the eternal world to come, which is non-corporal, according to the Rambam. Acharon, Acharon, Chaviv, the last concept of the Rambam is Mahut. Simply at the, at, at, Mahut can mean government. The Rambam says that all the laws of the Torah are just to make it able for the Jew better to know God. That actually there are just two commandments, and I'll sing also in very short. According to the Ram, there are only two commandments. The first and the second commandments of the Ten Commandments. To believe in God and not to worship idolatry. That's the whole Torah. Actually, this very same statement is, is said in Tanya. And all of the commandments are contained in these two. Because all of the positive commandments are to believe in God and all of the negative commandments are not to worship idolatry. And this is actually coming, this is the premise of the Rambam. The whole idea of, of government and society and actually all of the laws of the Torah, the Ram makes it very clear, is all simply a support system for the community and the individual to be able to best perform be Mekayim in Hebrew. These two commandments: to come to perfect faith of, in God, and not to worship idolatry. Idolatry is anthropomorphism. Idolatry is is identifying God with any physicality. That's for the Rambam idolatry, and that's that's just at the simple level. What what are the commandments all about? What are they for? And what is why do we have to invest so much time and energy into creating a social, a social reality which abides by the laws of the Torah? But there's something more about Malchut. Malchut is the question of, of, the, what, of the creation of the world. Unlike other philosophers, the Rambam does not connect the creation to, of the world, the, the question of was the world created ex nihilo or not, does not make it dependent upon faith in God at all. But faith in God, all of the precepts of faith in God, that God exists, that God is one, 
that God is non-corporal, that God is eternal, that we must pray the first five of the 13 principles of faith, which all apply to God, have no, no mention whatsoever and nothing to do with the question of whether the world was created by God or not. The concept of creation is a different category altogether. Unlike the Kalam, which are the, uh, in the time of the Rambam, the uh, philosophy of the, the Isla Islamic philosophy, which many of the great Islamic sages of his time and afterwards said, this is just an example to understand what are these two Rambams, the Rambam of the Code and the Rambam of the Guide, would say, that if I would just read the guide, I would think that the, this, the, the author of this book is an Islamic philosopher. That's what they said when studying the guide. But as he takes part with the style, is, he, he relies upon the second master of Fabri, the second master after Aristotle, is an Islamic sage, or the Rambam. But he parts with many of the philosophers. And he, in a very, very simple, uh, simple uh, precept of creation, according to that theory, and this is actually stated explicitly in Hasidut, as they said, as the Rambam denies. He said that first, it's provable or it's self-understood that the world must be mechudash, must be created, something from nothing. And if it's created, it must be a created reality. Reality is this table cannot come from a primordial matter. No such thing. Impossible. If, as soon as I understand that this table and everything, this whole world, this whole universe, must be created, then I can take the next step and say that if it's created, there must be a creator. The first thing about creation is that the Rambam denies that train of thought. The Rambam says there's no way it's non-obvious. You think that it's obvious that, that the world must have been created. It could not have existed forever. I say that it's not obvious at all. Aristotle said it's not only it's not obvious, he thought the very opposite. That the world is primordial. What's the phrase? There's a phrase that the greatest mind in Hasidic thought is called Rabbi Isaac of Homer talking about intellect, about pure intellect. One of the things that he explains throughout, and this is other Hasidic texts, is en davar ose tatsu. Nothing makes itself. This table did not make itself. Just like this table did not make itself, the universe did not make itself. That's, unless I misunderstand, that's the thought process of the Kalam, which the Rambam denies. That's the first thing that he denies. Afterwards, he distinguishes that there are three possible explanations for creation. One is the explanation of Moses. That's what he says. Yeah, Moses, the first Moses. Moses, Plato, and Aristotle. And he explains them exactly according to Kabbalah in the way of Briya Yitzhira That Moses says, holds, that the world was created de novo ex nihilo. It was created as something new from nothing. New from nothing. 
Plato says the world was created de novo new from something. And Aristotle says that the world is primordial, that it's neither new and certainly it's not from nothing. These three levels are exact, simple explanations of the three lower worlds. Because Bria, as the Rambam explains, the Ramban, Ahmadides, the word Bria means something from nothing. So it's both new and ex nihilo. But Yitzhira, the next world, is new. The appearance is, the, on the surface, is totally new. But it comes from some primordial matter called Yashmir. But Af Asitiv, the lower world, is just a, it's, it's not a, a new form altogether. It's, it's a, re, a retake, it's a continuous retake of, re, we call it now recycling. The lower world of Asiya is a continuous recycling of primordial matter. So the, the Rambam says that this is the, the belief of Moses, the belief of Plato, and the belief of Aristotle. And he says that I can't prove any either of these three. I just believe more in Moses, and if I see, he says that Moses makes a little bit more sense. Aristotle is against the Torah, so I must depart from him, even though he's my favorite in general. <laughs> but in this particular case, I must abandon him, because he, if he could prove it, I would have to accept it. But he can't prove it, and it, 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 uh, it contradicts the Torah, so I must, uh, I must leave him out. And Plato, he says, Bidi'eved, Bidi'eved means de facto, it's, you're not a heretic if you believe in Plato, in his level. But the best, the most sense is to believe in Moses. Okay, this all is the question of creation. Yes, creation, no creation. Three levels. Bria, Yitzhira, Asiyah, Moses, Plato, and Aristotle. But creation of this physical realm, of this universe that we're in, is also a question of Malchut. According to Kabbalah, the world was created from Malchut, from Malchut of Ensof. And from Malchut of the world of Atsilu comes out these three worlds, or the three conceptions of creation. And so that's where we're placing here also. And let's, can, let's uh, can now uh, conclude this whole, uh, after we went through now all of the ten sirot, conclude with the, with the thought that we mentioned before, who is the true Rambam? Again, for scholars, there are at least two. Actually, we could even identify three Rambams. Because just like we have the Rambam, the legal authority, the codifier of Jewish law, on the one side, we have the Rambam, the philosopher, the Aristotle philosopher on the other hand. In the middle, we have some another, a third Rambam, which is Rambam, the, the physician. After his brother drowned and he was left without uh, Panoso, without livelihood, he had to devote himself to study medicine. And he became perhaps the greatest physician of his time. And he became the physician of the Sultan of Egypt. And, uh, and he worked so hard in this field of medicine that virtually, even though he himself says, he, he swears, he makes an oath in, in the code, that whoever lives, he, he outlines a good lifestyle. 
And he says that whoever lives by this life, so I swear to him that he will live a long and healthy life and never be sick. He himself, so I would expect, if this is what he wrote, that he must, he should have lived uh, 120 years, 180 years, the Ram himself, because he, he, know, he knows the secret of, of how to live. Today is his yard site. Usually it was thought that the Ram lived a little bit less than 70 years. But most of the modern uh, scholars actually place his birthday three years later, meaning that he lived 66 years. It's a machloket as to when he was born, in which year he was born. The date of the birth is, is known because he himself writes. He was born on the 14th of Nisan in the afternoon, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, on the 14th of Nisan before the Seder. The very last thing that he composed in his lifetime was a treatise against astrology. As we know that he was super against astrology. But that was actually the last thing that he, that he wrote. But, uh, but he made a big point of the hour that he was born. <laughs> So, uh, in any event, why didn't he live so, so long? He knew the secret of good health. He was the greatest physician in the, in the world. So he himself say, actually for, foresees it and foretells it. He literally worked himself to death. He, wor he worked so hard in the court of the sultan and then afterwards when he came home he said he had hundreds of people every day that he had to treat, both Jews and non-Jews. Just waiting in line, he treated them for, for free. He says, he writes how exhausted he is. He, he literally worked himself to death. The Rambam. This is also part of his contradiction because he says, would it be up to me, he writes, I would have lived in solitude, in total seclusion, and devoted myself only to knowing God because this is what I believe, that the purpose of man on earth is to know God. And instead, in practice, in reality, I devoted my whole life to helping people the healing people. That's a contradiction. What is life for? What are you supposed to accomplish in life? So actually there are three Rambams. Once more, in healing people also, there was no distinction. The, the modern medical books say that the Rambam is actually the first physician to be totally non- uh, Kizani, <laughs> non-racial, no distinction whatsoever between a Jewish patient and a non-Jewish patient. And no talking, they make a point of no telling the patient what to believe in. Just pure practice of medicine. To, to, to heal other people. So we have Rambam, the, the Jewish law, the authority on Jewish law. We have Rambam, the, the physician. We have Rambam, the philosopher. Three different Rambams. It's Chash Mal Mal. The secret of these three Rambams. Who is the true Rambam? So again, in the, in the, in the university, they only speak of two Rambams. And they say, everyone, this is a, if, uh, it's almost a joke, that it says if, if you belong to, if you're in the secular world, the university, so the, it's clear it's a, for you that the true Rambam is the, is the, is the guide, the Rambam is the guide. And the Rambam that wrote the code of Jewish law, that's just for, for the simple believing 
Jews. But if you're a rabbi, so chas v'shalom, that's, that's heresy to say such a thing. The true Rambam is the Rambam of the, of the, of the code. That's the real Rambam. And we see that that is actually, actually the Hashkocha Protis has it, that that's the Rambam that has, that has remained the most. Even though scholars still study the guide, but uh, in, in yeshivas, nobody studies the guide, only the, the code of the Rambam. And the, and the depth of that code is so deep, how simple it is, it's so deep that there is unending Chidushim innovation in understanding the the uh, the depth of the thought of the Rambam in the code. So once more, for the rabbi, the Rambam is the code, and the the fact that he wrote this guy that just just that be explained away in a certain in a certain way that he had uh, also he wrote it for for even explicitly he wrote it for a few of, for one student maybe for another one. He wrote it for some people, for some people that were perplexed. All of the modern scholars say that the Rambam considered himself to be one of the perplexed. Perplexed. It's just like they say that the, uh, the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe, wrote it for himself. All great books, the author writes for himself. And so if he, write, if he wrote a guide for the perplexed, it means that he himself was one of those perplexed. So again, the question, so who is, who is the real Rambam? Get us, please stand up. It says, lo kam kemoshe, which means that he didn't stand, maybe he never went up to stand up. Who is the real Rambam? The code Rambam or the guide Rambam? Seems to be a contradiction. So maybe the physician in the middle can unite the two. Certainly there's one Rambam. There's another important thing about the Rambam that, uh, that, it, that he himself says that some, the question is, this uh, for scholars is maybe the most important things now in studying the Rambam. Do you, should you believe that this is, especially with regard to the guide or with other, in general, should we believe that to take on surface everything that the Rambam writes, that what he writes, he believes in? Sounds totally off the wall. Should we, does the Rambam really believe what he writes, or does he have some underlying secret opinion? Many that learn the guide after all of the trying to negate the opinion of Aristotle as to the primordiality of the, of the creation of the world, that the world is primordial, the universe. So they say that at the end, these are, these are secular scholars. They say the more that he defends Moses, they feel that that means the more that secretly he believes in Aristotle. <laughs> this has been a controversy amongst the scholars for the last hundred years. In any event, the Rambam himself says that when you're teaching a new student you have to teach him things which later on you will explain to him when he progresses and matures in his understanding that, th that those things that I taught you in grade one were only for grade one students. But now when you've reached the university, I'm teaching you things which actually contradict what I taught you in grade one. Now, this is okay because in general, sometimes you have to, give, for instance, give a, give a person, a, a child, a candy, and then afterwards he does it lishma. He learns it for, the, for its own sake. But he says more than that. Actually, he says at one point that there are seven 
forms of contradiction in writing and teaching. One of which is that first you say something that afterwards you're going to say the opposite. And second is, he says, I'm only going to talk about two of the seven. And the second is that you, sometimes a person teaches and expounds upon a certain topic based upon a premise. And the next class, he expounds again on a on that topic, based upon another premise, which contradicts the original premise. But the student doesn't know that. The teacher knows that, and the student does not know that the first premise, that the whole first lecture was based on, and the second premise that the second lecture was based on contradict one another. All right. A few classes ago, I think that we mentioned in short, just by a point, that from contradiction comes innovation. Even according to one theory of creation, Creation comes, is generated by contradiction. So this is something very, very, very deep in, that is expressed in the writings of the Rambam himself. On the, when I was saying two extremely opposite the Rama is usually understood to be the most rational thinker of all times. The most rational thinker, the most uh, logical thinker, the one that negates astrology and anything which is non-scientific, is non-rational, he negates, he fights against. But there's something underlying in the thought of the Rambam, we, and the thought, the contradiction is mystical. Why is contradiction mystical? Because contradiction is called nesiyat apachim, it's the ability to bear opposites. Only God bears opposites, and in Him, the opposites are not opposites at all. This is the foundation of Hasidot, actually. So once more, who, who is the true Rambam and this whole concept of contradiction? And now we're all giving it its source in the Torah, Moshe, Moshe, Lo, Psik, Tam, Abigavayo. We're saying here we have two Rambams. Before we said that Moshe, Moshe is the first Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, and this one, and our Moses, the Rambam. Now we're saying in a different way, that Moshe, Moshe is you. Moshe, there are two of you. like the once more in a quantum experiment. There are two Moseses coming up from the same slot. Moshe Moshe there's our code Moses and our guide Moses and maybe another third Moses all the Rambam. So he, he is foretelling us of uh, quantum reality and quantum physics and uh, messianic knowledge of God. So with this we'll conclude. <laughs> okay, whoever the real Rambam is. <laughs> Please stand I, up. <laughs> we hope he got lots of nachas from this shiur. <clears throat> Anyone who came to, the, to this shiur with a clear mind, I'm sure you're more perplexed now. <laughs> and if anyone came perplexed, hopefully you're more clear about things. About the Rambam, I don't know. <laughs> but from, from the Rambam till today, I don't know if he ever had it so good. <laughs> and 
Actually, just to let, I have to say the last thing you said, that Moshe, Moshe, so we see he had three 40-year periods of his life, and each one was very, very different. Right. And in fact, I learned this from you, that the, when he killed the Mitzri, so the Gematri of HaMitzri <coughs> equals Moshe. Yeah. So Moshe really did have three different stages in his life, each one very, very different. And yet he was the same Moshe. <clears throat> so that is somehow um, bridging the contradictions in his own life. Okay, a few announcements just in case people leave or um, can't watch anymore. The next shiur is uh, Sunday, February 4th, the 19th of Shvat. And I'm going to mention again uh, a very important uh, notice that Rav Ginsburg will be um, making, God willing, his uh, first lecture tour in America in many, many years. And uh, Gali Nai is looking for people who will not only step up <coughs> and help bring Rav Ginsburg to their city, their Bay Knesset or what, whatever, but also um, who can help with the um, financial uh, realities of making such a tour possible. So please write to Galainai either on WhatsApp or on the, uh, the email for this class and please step forward um, to making this uh, lecture tour uh, not only possible, but if it's successful, hopefully it will pave the way for many more in the future. Okay, so now we'll start with uh, our questions. We're going to start <clears throat> with questions from the Kahal here. Um, anyone has a question? I don't see any hands. Ah. Well, I already said I don't see any hands, so yours will be next. So um, I think uh, two obvious questions that um, I was kind of waiting for you to address was, um, especially in Keter and Faith, is maybe just some insight to the 13 principles of faith that maybe the Rambam is um, most known. It's in every sitter, and it's so much associated with the Rambam. If you want to tell us a little bit maybe why he felt necessary to do this, what's the, the background. And the second question is also a very obvious question, is... According to Rambam, his whole belief about uh, um, attributes of Hashem. So I know that you explained, but it definitely needs to be explained, the 13 midot of Rachamim, because that's probably the most explicit in the Torah, and it's revealed by God himself, about himself, as it were. So if you could address those two questions. Okay, according to the Rebbe of Kamano, eh, there's a long uh, treatise that he writes to, to see the correspondence between the 13 principles of, of, of faith that the Rambam outlines and the 13 attributes of mercy. So it's uh, very worthwhile to, to learn that. The reason that we didn't actually talk about, when I first thought about talking about the Rambam today, I thought maybe we would devote the whole thing to the 13 uh, after the 13 principles of faith of the Rambam, which may be the most famous thing. But uh, since we've had many classes on that in the past, I thought that it would be better to do something new, just like the, the world was created anew. But uh, the 13 principles for us is like primordial matter, but we, we believe in Chido so we have to do something new. We said that something new comes out of contradiction, so we have to have some contradiction, and then something new will happen. But 
once more, we've had many, many classes on the 13 principles, and the, the Chidosh is what we now said that the Kamana Rabbi does see a direct correspondence between the 13 principles and the 13 attributes of mercy, and the 13 attributes of mercy in Kabbalah correspond to the 13 Tikkunei Digna, the uh, sections of the divisions of the symbolic beard of Arihanpin. The reason that that uh, one thought we had that we didn't express express uh, explicitly, we talked about anger in Keter. Why so? Because and anger does not exist in God. The, th the name for Keter is Arichan Pin, which means that he never gets angry. The Elan Pin is the possibility. The lower, the small, what's called the small countenance, is the appearance of anger. But Arich Anpin, which is the cater, really means that he himself is never angry. So that's exactly the thought that we made before, and that's where the 13 principles come from. And obviously the 13 principles of mercy is definitely, as you said, are the, is the most important place in the Torah that, that we have attributes of God. That God has given attributes, and they're all mercy. And all of them has to be understood in the way of that, of the Rambam, to, in, the, in the manner of negation. And that's, that's what we addressed at some length right now. I, I, I have to admit, I lost my train of thought, so I'm going to ask the Raf to repeat the question. No, you <laughs> repeat it again. Um, can you repeat it like um, s slowly and more simply? Okay, just to simplify that, it's a very deep, deep question, but um, the question is asking the Rav to clarify um, <clears throat> uh, in more detail or, or better this idea of evil coming, a little bit of evil coming from nature, a little bit of evil coming from other people or circumstances, but the vast majority of evil is coming from the person himself in light of different statements in the Sechet Shabbat and the Tanya and Eov. The Ram says that all of these levels exist and everything, every quote is referring to one of these levels. But he just says that the majority is coming from oneself, that's all. Every quotation is true and it's a question of proportion. No, it says that the no ra comes comes from a mala, mila mala. That's working through man himself. That maybe, 
the man in God gives him. The Rambam explains when talking about astrology and other things that man is born with the, with the inclination to different uh, to either good or evil, but he can overcome it with true choice. That's the whole idea of, of uh, free choice. Even when it says Nora, the, the quote that he quoted now is that sometimes it said that as though that God Himself is almost seducing the person to do the same thing wrong, whether it's Adam or whether it's King David. According to the Rambam, in any case whatsoever, there is never Nora Lilab Bnei Adam which overrides the power of free choice. That's all. That's very strong and definite in the thought of the room. The person has free choice, and if he does not use that free choice positively, even though he's being pushed by providence in a certain direction, if he succumbs to that push and doesn't use his free choice to overcome that, he's responsible. No? So that's, again, that's not like the Rambam. So he, yeah. he doesn't believe that people come from the Rambam. Right now, we won't talk about somebody else, but not just talking about that. According to the Rambam, he's very tremendously adamant about the power of free choice. And therefore, he says that anything that, uh, that a person does bad to himself, even though there are reasons for it, psychological reasons, social reasons for it, or divine reasons for it. But he could have overcome that by using his free choice to the maximum. In, you know daily, daily life, to which Rambam will uh, provide the same the, 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 the Muslim? To the physician, to the law, or to the philosopher? Okay, the question is of the three Rambams that the Rav um, presented to us, which one it, should we emulate in our day? Which one should be the example that we should um, be most influenced by or follow? All right, so we said that, that the three, we, have, we put together according to this uh, formula, which is called Chash Mamal. Chash is submission, Hachnav Dalam Taka, and the terminology of the Baal Shem Tov. The first Rambam is the, it's even chronologically the case. The first Rambam is the Rambam of the Code, and that is our submission to receive the yoke of heaven, of the kingdom of heaven, and to be a good Jew that does the, uh, that performs the, uh, the will of God through, through the means of his commandments. That's the first Rambam. And that's the first Rambam in, in ourselves. The second Rambam will call him the physician, the person that takes, that cuts himself off of what he would like to do in order to help other people, in order to devote himself to other people. So we'll call that Havdalah. Circumcising himself, that's mal, is self-circumcision. And the third Rambam is to doing what he really likes to do, and then with this we agree with the, with the university people. <laughs> And they, with himself, actually, because he says himself that what he really was into was was philosophy. That was his real love, because that's as he says that he wanted to come close to God, and that's the way he felt that he was coming close.